Hey, Generation Church, how we doing today? So good to see everybody here to our church family online. So glad you guys are watching online. Hit us up in the chat. Let us know where you're watching from. You can ask questions. You can get prayer right there. Uh, and if you're new to Generation Church, either in-house or online, we just want to say welcome home. Welcome to the family. Uh, you know, we had 1,700 people here just a few weeks ago for Easter over the four services. And I uh, see so many of those faces and families that are back. And it's so good to see you. I know God's got something special for you. So I just encourage you, get connected with the family here and, and explore what God has in store for you. Can we just give it up for all those that are new to Generation Church? So glad you're here. So we're in the middle of a series on family and relationships and parenting and sexuality and uh, everybody wants to know when I'm going to do mended, blended and extended families and I'm not telling you so that you'll come to every series session. <laughs> Just to get that one, I know there's a lot of blended families and, and uh, God has, uh, the scripture has a lot to say about that. And, uh, and so hopefully this series is, is being helpful to you and, and your family uh, because your families are under attack. Uh, God has established the family as part of, of who he is and who we are. You're a part of the body of the Christ. You're, you're the bride of Christ. Your family in its construct is, is God's idea for family. And so because family is so important to God, there are forces of evil that are assigned to assassinate the parts and pieces of our family that it can, to try to break family apart, to try to run children away from the Lord, to try to break marriages apart. And so this series hopefully is helping, helping us to uh, to understand what those forces are. So the, the series title is Heirs and Assassin. Uh, heir is what you are. You are a child of God and you are an heir to the inheritance of the kingdom of God. And that's an important thing for you to know. The scripture says that you are a co-heir with Christ. Meaning that as Christ is the son of God, that you are a joint heir or a co-heir. That everything that Christ has, you have. The same power that raised Christ from the dead also is available to you. Romans 8, 11, to quicken your mortal body. And, and so because you have that inheritance at your fingertips, the enemy doesn't want you to know how to access that and, and to enjoy the benefits of being a part of a child of God. And, and so I wanted to help us understand what we have at our fingertips, but also to understand what is against us. And those forces that are assigned to assassinate literally your legacy and your heritage. So just a couple quick things before we get into the content today. Uh, I know we're all in different places in life. Some of us are married. Some of us are not married. Some of us wish we weren't married. Some of us were married and we want to get married again. I would just encourage you wherever you are in life, God's got something for you. So don't check out. Uh, he will speak something to you directly. If you're not married yet, take good notes. And all the married people said, yep. You're going to need them. And uh, I would also encourage you to, to listen for yourself and not listen for somebody else. I was at the gym this week and I was talking to somebody and they, they told me, they said, you know, I, I really enjoyed the message and my husband was traveling and I was waiting for him to listen to the message and, and I got something out of this message. And so when, when we got a, a chance to connect, I was like, so what did you think? And, and, and he didn't answer what I thought he was going to answer. I was like, well, what about... The message, what did you think? And, and, and then as he started to talk about what it meant to him, it wasn't what it meant to her. And she was like, oh, well, dang. I was just listening for him instead of me. And I would just encourage you, no elbow on your, your spouse today, okay? This is for you, listen. No, 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 just listen for yourself because God has something specific for you. And then last thing, and I'll, I'll shut up and we'll get into the content. I know that there is a lot of pain and hurt around relationships. Relationships are messy. And because of that, we can sit in a service like this and it exacerbates our wounds. And I just wanna, I wanna let you know, first of all, we're here to love you, we're here to care for you as a family. That's, that's what the body of Christ is about. And if you're hurting, we're here for you. We have prayer stations at the, uh, at the exit doors. You can get prayer today when you leave. Uh, but if you're hurting today and you walk away from this message and it didn't quite talk about what you're dealing with, that's okay. Because what, whatever it is that you're dealing with, I'm not here to fix every problem that we have, nor can I address every problem that everybody has. There's too many of those. What I'm here to do is to point you to Christ. And so 
even, even if I don't get into the specifics of what you're dealing with, that doesn't mean that this, this day was a loss. It just means you take what you're dealing with to God and trust him. And he will work on it. He will speak to you. He will heal you. He, he will do what needs to happen in your life. So make sure that you trust him and take your things that you're dealing with and working on, take it to him. Okay, so I want to talk to you today under this title, uh, The Assassin of Sexual Sin. The Assassin of Sexual Sin. Turn to your neighbor and say, rut row. <laughs> um, you know, here's, here's the thing about human sexuality. Human sexuality is part of how God created humanity, and he did it in such an integrated way that you can't get away from it. You know, if you were an alcoholic, you can become a teetotaler and just stay away from alcohol the rest of your life. But you can't do that with your sexuality. Your sexuality is part of your anatomy. Your sexuality is part of your endocrine system and, and all of your hormones. You can't be a teetotaler when it comes, you can abstain from sex, but that doesn't mean you still don't want it. Come on, somebody. You can't completely cut that off. And so because of that, instead of trying to, to, to uh, uh, encapsulate ourselves or insulate ourselves away from dealing with human sexuality, we have to learn how to manage human sexuality the way God intended for us to do it. The Bible says in Genesis 2 and 25 about Adam and Eve, it says in the Bible that they were naked and unashamed. Meaning they were just throwing strawberries at each other, fanning each other in the nude, you know. <laughs> It's like in a garden, just frolicking, la, 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 and just, just hanging out naked. But then when they sinned, the Bible specifically says that they were naked and ashamed. The purity and the innocence that God created in their sexuality was now tainted. And all of us throughout human history, we live in the wake of that. And you can't get away from it. So God wants to help us understand how to live in it and how to manage it. And I would just encourage you today as you listen to this message to not be condemned. I'm not here to condemn you, although my opinion is worthless. God's not here to condemn you. This church is not here to condemn you. Please don't confuse condemnation and conviction. I do believe God will convict us today of some areas that we need to work on and grow and change, and that's okay. But don't take that and say that it's condemnation. It's not. Because if you're in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation. There's only love and care and forgiveness and healing and help. So let's talk about how we can deal with the assassin of sexual sin. You know, we've been talking about the life of King David because King David's family dynamic was probably the most rich with content from all of scripture. Uh, he had about eight wives, as we can count, 19 kids, 19 sons, a couple daughters. Uh, he had a, a blended and mended and extended family. Uh, he had a, a, a lot of successes and a lot of failures. He, he probably was the most successful king of the scripture. As a matter of fact, the Bible even says in the New Testament about him that he was a man after God's own heart, but yet he had all of these family dynamics that quite honestly were, were just a mess. His first marriage we talked about last week to Michal was, was com completely uh, nuked and, and, and fell apart, and, and he kept adding marriages to the mess. And then we get to his seventh wife, and her name is Bathsheba. Men, can I just tell you, when you meet a woman and the word bath is in her name, run! <laughs> he meets this woman, Bathsheba, and, uh, and it, it, it entices something inside of him that gets out of control. See, he was supposed to be with his army fighting in the battles, accomplishing the mission of God that God had anointed him to do as the king. But instead of doing that, he was hanging out in the palace with no accountability. His closest guards and generals were not there with him. Nobody there to body check his decisions or his actions. And all of a sudden, the assassin of sexual sin showed up. 
See, God clearly gives us the, the manual on human sexuality. Uh, God invented sex, by the way. It is not a bad thing. God wants you to enjoy the gift of sex, but the assassin of human sexuality wants to pervert it for you. And we live in a day and in an age where that force is at full work. Pervasive through our society. And in some ways, it's so pervasive that the truth about the gift of sex and how God designed it for us has almost been erased from our culture. And because of that, we walk around, many of us, wounded. And if you are really honest and vulnerable today, most of us have some instance or instances in the past that involved our sexuality that have created pain for us, that have created wounds. And for a lot of us, those wounds go unhealed. And I believe that today God wants to, to heal some of those wounds. I think God wants to, to help us to, to have our sexuality the way that he intended for it to, to happen. You know, no, nobody on Netflix is saying uh, that sex God's way ruined my life. Yeah. You know, you ever hear that? Like, you never see people with a great marriage that are like, this is for the birds. There's way better ways to have sex than God's way. Nobody ever says that. Sex God's way doesn't ruin your life. Nobody ever claims that because it is the best way because it's how God designed it. But so often, you know, we take matters into our own hands. Culture is very pervasive and very, very um, persuasive. And, and we sometimes think that we know better how to operate what God has created for us and given us. And a lot of times when we do that, it creates problems for us. You know, God gives us the, the manual, if you will, on human sexuality. It's, it's very well established and, and written in scripture. And God doesn't give us the manual on human sexuality to uh, take away our fun. He's not trying to wreck us by it. He's actually trying to protect us with it. Just like the... Uh, the engineers and inventors of this fine piece of equipment. The, the manual for this is not designed to take away your fun. The manual for how to operate this is to keep you from cutting your leg off. And, and when the Bible tells us how to enjoy human sexuality, God is not trying to take away our fun. He's trying to protect us. For my next trick, we're going to juggle. No, but um, this is a, a fine tool that, when used in an improper way, can create damage. And, and our human sexuality is very similar. When we step outside of the manual of how God designed sex, it can be damaging. And so I want to help unpack for us today what the Bible says. It clearly defines what sex is. Sex is defined to be enjoyed within the confines of the marriage of a man and a woman. Now, our society rages against that idea. But because society rages against that idea doesn't mean that it's still not true. The creator of this can tell the user exactly how it's supposed to be used. And when we use it the way it's supposed to be used, it performs the way it was supposed to perform. And our sexuality is no different. Hebrews 13 and 4 says this, that marriage is honorable among all, and that the marriage bed is undefiled. But fornicators, that's sex outside of marriage, and adulterers, people who are married and have sex with someone else, God will judge. 
And that's a harsh term, but in order to maintain the purity of sexuality, there has to be some consequence to using it inappropriately. So God tells us that if we just use it the way he designed it, that it is undefiled, that it's beautiful, it's exciting, it's exhilarating. Which, by the way, all of the perversion that we encounter in this world doesn't make sex better. It actually cheapens the real thing. The other parameters that God gives us is that sex outside of marriage is known as something called fornication. Fornication is listed in 1 Corinthians 6 and 18. It says to flee fornication, which is the smallest sin in the Bible. Flee fornication, like little tiny fleas. It's semi-funny. Listen, it is semi-funny. I, I get it. And if I start the jokes way down here, they, they get better, I promise. No, but he says to flee fornication. He's not talking about literal fleas. To flee fornication in every sin that man does without the body. But he that committeth fornication sins against his own body. We'll talk about that in a bit. Adultery. Uh, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus talks about sleeping with someone else's spouse. And not only the act itself, but even the lustful thoughts that even if you think it in your heart, you've committed it in your heart. And that's outside of the confines of marriage. The next one is homosexuality in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9. He says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites. And if I can just for a moment help balance this out for some of us, please, as a Christian or a follower of Christ, don't make homosexuality some special sin that is worse than the rest of them. Don't, don't point your finger at someone who is struggling with homosexuality when you have your own level of fornication. Okay, it, it is not a special sin, a different sin, a worse sin. Sin is sin, just like speeding which most of us did on the way to church today, because I saw everybody come in in the second song. I'm just saying. If I can just pass through, if you can't say amen, say ouch. So let, let's not be judgmental. Let's take the plank out of our own eye, okay, as it relates to this. But then if you are struggling with homosexuality, even though it is all the, 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 um, all of the, the, the narrative today in our world, if you're struggling with that, know that God is here to help you with it. God loves you, and he created sexuality for you within the confines of marriage between a man and a woman. The, the next parameter of human sexuality is, is that God gave us passions, but not lustful passions. So what this does not mean is, is that um, you can't be passionately in love with your spouse, and that you can't have an amazing, uh, intimate time with them. You can't but you're not supposed to have lustful passions outside of the confines of that relationship. So God gives us this because every time we get outside of the lines of how he designed sex, we wound ourselves. We cut ourselves. But the good news is God is always here to heal us. So sometimes like David, you know, we disregard God's will on sexual matters. And even though God redeems us in the situation, there's still parts of David's life and legacy that were assassinated by his actions. And even though God loves you and forgives you and heals you, there are still consequences to how we live. And so God's best for us is to not let the world define sexuality for you, but let God define it for you. Amen. So let's get into this Second Samuel chapter 11. Verse 1, it says, In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent, to jo sent Joab out with the king's men and, and the whole Israelite army. And they destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. And David sent to find out about her. And the man said that she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam, the wife of Uriah, the wife of Uriah. I can just see this whole conversation taking place in the palace. 
the Hittite. Uriah the Hittite, not Uriah the Menentite. The Hittite. It's semi-funny again, I know. So when David found himself, listen to this. This is where I have to be careful. When David found himself hanging back from the place he was supposed to be, which is on the front lines with his army, that is when he encountered Bathsheba bathing on the rooftop. He found himself in a compromised situation. If you want to take some notes today, the first thing that we have to do is we have to run from compromising situations. David should have ran to the battlefield when he saw Bathsheba. But instead of running to the battlefield, he watched her. And he allowed that to do something in him that caused him to, to want her. And then that want went from desire to action. And then that action ended up with him sleeping with her, having a kid, and creating a huge mess. And David's trying to fix this whole mess, but he can't because he colored outside of the lines. He went outside of the manual. And when I say run, I don't say that lightly. You have to run out of compromising situations. My best example is in, in Joseph's story in the Old Testament when it's the, the story of the first desperate housewife. Anybody watch that? Potiphar's wife. She comes over to, Josh, to Joseph and she's like, hey, 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 take me now, boy, or lose me forever. And he's like, I'm out of here. And he ran so fast that he ran right out of his shirt. Do you guys know the story? This is how we should operate when the assassins of sexuality show up. Don't toy with this stuff. Don't, don't mess with this stuff. You have to run from compromising situations. So being alone at the office with that girl who's cute and flirts with you all the time, Run from that situation. Don't toy with that. Don't, when you start to feel those little feelings like, I wonder what that would be like. Run from that situation. Run from that girl. Run from that guy because you can never win from a losing position. Never win from a losing position. So sleeping over, young people, I know it's like all the thing. We're not going to have sex. We're just going to sleep over. Bull, you're going to get halfway. We're not going to Netflix and chill. We're just going to Netflix. You're going to get halfway through the documentary that you really don't like because it's Netflix. And then it's going to end up being something that goes outside of God's prescribed limits for sexuality. And then shame and guilt and remorse and oftentimes dirtiness, it ensues. After the dopamine wears off and the feelings are gone, all of a sudden you feel like, what have I done? Why, why did I allow this to, to happen? Traveling together, I, I see young people in their 20s traveling together all the time. You're not married, don't, don't travel together. You have, have a lifetime of travel ahead of you. But when you're, oh, we're going to stay in separate rooms. Bull, you can't afford the one room that you're going to sleep together in. <laughs> Run from compromising situations. Run from those things that are trying to pull you outside of God's context for the gift of sex. Business trips. When I used to work in pharmaceuticals. Holy Jesus. You put two, 3,000 people together in a city, in multiple hotels, all drinking wine and learning about pharmaceuticals, and it is debauchery. And it's like that in a lot of business industries. A lot of marriages are broken on business trips. A few years ago, I had a couple that um, sat in my office. Great couple. The husband was a sommelier, he, meaning he sold wine and um, and was very successful at that. And uh, at a business trip, consumed a little too much of his product and had sex with a girl on his team and had to come home and face the reality of that with his wife and his kids. And he should have ran from that situation because there was nothing in that 30 second interaction, if we're being realistic, Maybe 60, he was drunk. (laughs) 
that was worth the years of wounding for his wife and himself and his kids. So I have to run and, and, and be careful to, to not get consumed by the sway of this world. Everybody does it. I got to try it before I buy it. I need to know if we're compatible. No, you don't. God made people compatible. He, he made you compatible. Your DNA, your, your hormones, your physical body, he made it. You don't need to try it. He made you to fit. He made your anatomy to fit. He made all of that. to You might not like them, but you fit sexually with them. I'm just saying. He made it that way. So you don't need to try it out first. That's an enticement of the enemy to get you outside of God's blessing for sexuality. Romans 13 and verse 14 says this. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. Make no provision for the flesh. Make no provision compromising circumstance or situation for the flesh because it is going to catch up with you. Second Samuel 11 verse 2. This is one evening David got up from his bed and he walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof he saw a woman bathing. Saw. He saw her with his eyes. And the woman was very beautiful and David sent for someone to find out about her and the man said she is Bathsheba the daughter of Elam the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Number two. You have to guard your eyes from sexually explicit content. He saw her. He, he was in a compromised situation. He should have been at work. He should have been on the battlefield. He should have been with his generals. He should have been doing what God anointed him to do as king. But in a compromising situation, he began to see someone who was naked on a rooftop taking a bath. And when it came through his eyes, it planted a seed in his heart. Look at me very closely. What you continually see, you will eventually be. What you continually mind, you will eventually find. What you're watching, what you're thinking about, what you're seeing, eventually it will grow into something that is out of control for you and you will grab a hold of it. Because Proverbs tells us as a person thinks in their heart, so are they. What this does is, is it will fascinate you and then it will assassinate you. You'll be fascinated by human sexuality, intrigued by what, the, what it might be like. Your hormones go crazy, your dopamine surges and you think, oh wow, this could be so amazing. And, and you're fascinated by it in the moment and then it's nothing but regret and guilt and mess to clean up at the end. We gotta watch what we see run from sexually explicit content. You know, we have porn in our pockets these days. It's right there in your phone. So you gotta be careful. Job said, I'm gonna make a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a young woman. Make a covenant with your eyes. Get, get some, some resources, install them on your devices. And I know that it's not 100%, but instead of stumbling into sin, what if we set up enough stuff on our devices to cause us to stumble into purity, right? Instead of stumbling into an affair or an adultery, what if you blocked everything you could? What if you put passwords to your spouse and everything like that so when you stumble, you stumble into purity instead of impurity? Like, like let's do what we can do to fight against the things that are trying to assassinate our sexuality. And what you see is huge. So you have to run from explicit content. The Bible says in Matthew 6 and 22, the eye is the lamp of the body. And if your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? So what we see on reels, what we stream, what you read about in the news, surfing the net. Ladies, I don't know if you still read romance novels, but even that begins to stir things inside of us that, that um, are, are unhealthy for our sexuality. You've gotta make a covenant with our eyes. The third thing is this, we have to run from the casual hookup culture that exists in our world. And it is such a casual hookup culture that, ah, you know, everybody does it, I can just do this. What if we pursued sexual purity instead of pursued the next hookup? What if we pursued this the way God designed it? 
See, see, we kind of think in our society today, because everybody does it, that a casual hookup is not going to become a massive mess up. But it does. David thought this. But his casual hookup turned into a young woman getting pregnant that turned into manipulation and eventually murder. And just because the sway of the world says this is what everybody does doesn't mean that that's the way God created it. Listen to this. Data from the 2002 survey on sexuality says this. It indicates that by age 20, 70, 77% of respondents had had sex. 75 had had premarital sex outside of the confines of marriage. And 12% had been married. By age 44, not the 40-year-old the virgin exists. Praise God. By age 44, 95% of respondents, 94% of women, 96% men, and 97% of those who had ever had sex had had premarital sex. So by your 40s, 97% of people have had sex, but in the high 90s, it was, it was outside of the confines of marriage. So it's an epidemic in our world. But because it's an epidemic, doesn't make it the correct way. And now we have generations of people who are, are completely broken and wounded by our sexuality. And so we have to run from the casual hookup culture. First Corinthians, listen to this. First Corinthians 6 and 15. This is, this is why. He says, don't you realize that your bodies are actually parts of Christ? Think about that for a second. Your body is a part of the body of Christ as a child of God. So what you do with your body means that you are also exposing the body of Christ to. So should a man take his body, which is a part of Christ, and join it to a prostitute? Never. And in the Greek language, it's the most emphatic use of the word never. It's as uh, pronounced as they could make it. Never. And don't you realize, verse 16, that if a man joins himself to a prostitute, he becomes one body with her. So what Paul is telling us is that sexual sin, the assassin of sexual sin, is not only an assault on your body and on their body, but also on the body of Christ. And here's why. For the scriptures say that two are united into one. So sexuality is not just a mere action like scratching your back or eating food, or yawning, or exercising. Sexuality is spiritual because two different flesh become united in sexual union. Verse 17, but the person who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. So now, Paul is telling us that you're not only one flesh with that person, but now you become united in spirit with the body of Christ. Verse 18. Run! There it is again. <laughs> I love that. Everybody's like, ah. <laughs> Run from sexual sin. Exclamation point. Run from sexual sin. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. And again, I, I, God's not condemning you. He's trying to help you. God's not trying to tell you not to use the chainsaw. He's just trying to help you not cut your leg off in the process. So run from sexual immorality. Sexual sin is the only sin that affects your body and the body of Christ and the body of that person directly. It is a sin against your body. And David thought he could fix it, but he couldn't. And we think that we can fix it, but we can't. So when David had sex with Bathsheba, he, he developed this elaborate plan to fix what was assassinating his future and his heritage. He was about to get found out. And so he says in, in Samuel, 2 Samuel 10 and 11, David was told, Uriah did not go home. And they asked Uriah, why have you... Uh, why haven't you just come for a military campaign? Why didn't you go home? And Uriah said to David, the ark and, and Israel and Judah are staying in tents and my commander Joab and my Lord's men are camped in the open country. How can I go to my house and eat and drink and make love to my wife? Basically what he's saying is 
your elaborate plan to get me to come home and make love to my wife so that we could sell this child as mine and hers is not working out. And so David's elaborate plan was falling apart. And so David sends him back out, but this time not just to the battle, he sends him out to the front lines so that he would be killed, so that David could take Bathsheba and marry her. And what David thought he could fix ultimately blew apart. And I'm telling you, I've lived this life. What you think you can fix just becomes a mess that grows bigger and bigger and bigger until finally it's out of control and you do things that you never thought you would do in order to contain something that God never wanted you to have to deal with. And if you can just live this life, this human sexuality, the way God designed it, you can avoid all the wounding and pain that comes around the assassin of sexuality. Number four, we have to run from our sexual blind spots. We all have blind spots in life. We all have things that we can't necessarily see about ourselves, and we all have sexual blind spots. David had sexual blind spots. David couldn't see the things that he was doing and the path that he was taking. And then prophet Nathan comes to David and he brings this story to David about this, this wealthy man who steals this poor guy's only lamb. Just steals it. He has thousands of lambs of his own, but he comes and he steals this poor, lowly guy's only lamb. And David is infuriated. David's response to, to Nathan the prophet says, well, whoever this guy is, he should die. And he should repay fourfold, fourfold for what he has stolen. And David didn't know that Nathan the prophet was not talking about an actual lamb, but he was talking about the king who had stolen Uriah's wife. And David didn't know it at the moment, but he would figure it out over his life that his pronouncement of repaying what he took four times would actually come to pass starting with the first son that Bathsheba and David had. And within the first week, that child would die. And three other sons of David's would die premature early deaths because of David's sexual sin. And if we think that sexual impurity does not have an assignment to assassinate our legacy, you're wrong. Nobody gets by it. Nobody gets around it, and the enemy knows it. And he tries every way to lure us in to it. So what are your sexual blind spots? You ever notice like you, a friend that you have and, and they start dating somebody and all of a sudden you see all these maneuvers that they're making and you're like, that's not you. Why are you doing this? And they're like, what, I haven't changed. I'm the same idiot I was always. Me included. And you walk away from friends and family and relationships and people that lay their life on the line for you and you're just la, 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 la. Just going for it with somebody that, that's just new to the equation. Why is that? You have a blind spot. And God has put people and family and friends and pastors and churches in their lives to not to take away your fun and to ruin your, your, your next relationship, but to, to help you know and understand you're walking in a blind spot. I can't prove this, but most theolog theologians believe that David wrote this. In Psalm 119, verse 9, he says, how can a young person stay pure? I bet he asked that question a lot in his older years. He says, by obeying your word, I have tried hard to find you. So don't let me wander from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I praise you, O Lord, teach me your decrees. I have recited aloud all the regulations you have given us. I have rejoiced in your laws as much as in riches. 
And I will study your commandments and reflect on your ways. And I will delight in your decrees and not forget your word. So I'm not here to condemn you and God is not here to condemn you. My assignment here is to just share the scripture with you. And I believe that God's intent is to convict us. Which literally means, convict means to convince. To convince us that there's a better way. To convince us that sexuality is a gift from God made to be enjoyed in the confines of marriage. To help us to to get into the proper context of human sexuality. And so today, if your heart is pounding and and, and you're wrestling with this, that it's not condemnation, it's conviction. And I would just encourage you to open your heart to what God is saying to you because he's not trying to harm you, he's trying to help you. He's trying to heal you. He's trying to help those wounds that, that we walk around with get healed. He's trying to, to deliver us from chains of bondage that have, have held us down. He wants you to be free to enjoy sexuality the way that he created it.